It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video, I'm going to be taking a look at the Philips Evnir 49M2C8900L. As usual for video review, what you see depends on my camera, depends on the processing done by my video editing software and by YouTube, and ultimately, and very importantly, it depends on the screen that you're actually viewing the video on, so it doesn't accurately represent what you'd see firsthand using the monitor. I'm going to be using two different camera lenses throughout this video, switching between them. One of them allows me to show you the entirety of the monitor. It's a very wide monitor, so I need an ultra wide lens for that. And the other one is more of a detail focused lens, which will help capture some of the finer details I'm gonna be talking about. In the description of the video, you'll find a link to supporting content, as well as information about how you can support the work that we do. Be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, they're nice ways of showing your support. So this monitor uses a 49 inch, or what's rounded to 49 inch, 32 by 9 ultra wide panel with a 5120 by 1440 resolution and it's a Samsung display QD OLED panel. It has a curve to the screen, just going to quickly mention that, you'll be able to see that from the video. Not too much to say about the curve really, I'd just say that it does feel very natural when using the monitor. It's a 1800R curve and I feel it really does suit a monitor which is this wide. I think it would feel really odd without a curve having a monitor this wide but the curve isn't so steep that it makes everything look distorted or weird. I know it does look like there's a pin cushion effect on the video or when you're looking at pictures of the monitor, but that isn't something which you observe by eye when you're using the monitor. And I did find that I could adapt to the curve very readily. Due to the width of the screen, I prefer sitting around 80 to 90 centimeters from the screen if I can, which is a bit further back than I generally sit from monitors, which would be closer to maybe 70 centimeters or just a touch further back than that. I find that if I'm sitting 70 centimetres from the monitor, even if I'm sitting maybe 80 centimetres, I'm just moving my neck quite a lot, which feels quite unnatural. I prefer just moving my eyes when I'm looking at monitors, especially when I'm looking at content near the edges of the screen. I don't really want to be moving my neck a lot, and you might be when you're on the desktop. So this is something which you can decrease, the kind of head movement, by increasing the distance between yourself and the monitor. Nice for multitasking all of this horizontal width and decent vertical pixel real estate. Certainly good for a horizontal spread of applications. So I've got three different applications here. I've got plenty of useful space for the word processing in the middle there. I've got a website on the left, which is my forum, and a website on the right, my main website. It's also nice for things like video editing. You get a huge amount of horizontal space for your timeline and that kind of thing. Really useful for that. And the pixel density is also decent. So basically this screen, it's like having two 27 inch screens side by side with a QHD resolution, 2560 by 1440. You get the same pixel density, you get the same height, and you get the same width as two of those monitors side by side without any central bezels impeding the experience. For games, the extreme width is also highly immersive, although more height would further increase this feeling. Your horizontal peripheral vision is engaged very nicely and the enhanced field of view, FOV, naturally provided with the 32 by 9 aspect ratio, means you can see a lot more of the game environment at once. It also means that key HUD elements, such as the map, ammo counts, player health, and that kind of thing, they can be very much peripheral, and you'd have to scan your eyes pretty far across the screen to actually see them. I will be showing off some gameplay in this review at various points for my test titles, such as Battlefield, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and Cyberpunk, which do properly support this resolution in the main game. And to give you a quick idea of the field of view you can get with the 32 by 9 aspect ratio, this is a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, so 2560 by 1440. And this is the full 32 by 9 aspect ratio, so 5120 by 1440. So you get the same amount vertically, but a lot more information horizontally. And if you were running a 21 by 9 aspect ratio, it would be somewhere between these two, although the monitor doesn't have any 21 by 9 resolutions on its EDID, so I'm not going to show you that. You'd have to create a custom resolution for that if you wanted to. It's worth noting that quite a few modern game titles do support the 5120 by 1440 resolution, but certainly not all games do. Some support 21 by 9, but not 32 by 9, whilst others only support more conventional aspect ratios, such as 16 by 9. It's really just a case of researching the particular games you play, and at least if you do need to put up with black bars at the sides, they can look nice and deep and inky in dimmer lighting, unlike you generally see on LCDs. And just a quick mention, as for viewing video content, you can use browser extensions such as Ultra Widefy to help content fill up the screen, and that works better for movie content that's mastered in ultra wide or so-called cinema scope formats rather than 16x9. So think content you might watch at a cinema rather than on TV. 
And I'm going to take a look at the refresh rate supported by the monitor and some of the associated features. So at the native resolution, you can get up to 144 Hz with alternatives such as 120 Hz and 60 Hz also listed. You can get all of that at up to 10 bits per channel. You can also use VRR, variable refresh rate technologies at the same time, such as NVIDIA G-Sync compatible and AMD FreeSync Premium. That's via DisplayPort at least. Via HDMI, the monitor has HDMI 2.0 ports, not HDMI 2.1 ports, so there's no HDMI VRR support. Although you can use AMD FreeSync via HDMI, just be aware that the maximum refresh rate, whether you're using FreeSync or not, it's 75 Hz. And 60 Hz is also supported. And you've got 8 bits per channel maximum. You can use HDR via HDMI as well. The 4K UHD downsampling mode is also supported by HDMI, which runs it up to 60 Hz. So that could be useful for the Xbox Series X, for example, where it needs to be using a 4K UHD signal to actually support HDR. However, the usefulness of this setting is limited by the fact the monitor doesn't support its smart size scaling functionality with this resolution. So it's always going to stretch it right across the screen at an incorrect aspect ratio, which distorts the image. I'm now going to look at scaling on the monitor for lower resolutions. So I'm running the monitor at its native resolution at the moment. I'm going to switch over to QHD at 144 Hz. Now when you do that, it says resolution 5120 by 1440 and it's using GPU scaling here. So that's giving you these black bars. And this is really how you'd generally want to have the 2560 by 1440 resolution. So there's no interpolation going on. It's just that you have any unused pixels blacked out. I'm now setting it to the same resolution at 120 hertz, and it would be the same if I'd set it to 60 hertz. And you'll see the image is completely stretched across the screen. It doesn't look nice at all. It looks all distorted and weird, although it is using all of the pixels. You can see it says resolution 2560 by 1440, at the bottom left there as well. So the monitor is actually using its own scaling now. If you go to system, there's a smart size setting, which you can adjust. Just be aware that that isn't available if you have adaptive sync enabled. So if you want to be using resync, and you're not at a PC, so you can't use GPU scaling and you have to rely on the monitor scaling, then it's going to be stretched across the screen like this, which also happens with the 4K UHD resolution. There's no smart size option with the 4K resolution, regardless of whether you're using adaptive sync or not. So let's say you don't want to use GPU scaling or you can't use GPU scaling and you really want to use smart size. So I've got VRR disabled now, adaptive sync disabled. A few different options here, various different simulated screen sizes. I'm not going to go through all of these. I'll just show you 27 inch wide quickly. And that's very similar to what I was showing you before with the GPU scaling. You can see there are various other options here, all the way down to 18.5 inch wide. Hopefully you can see these in the video. I know sometimes the camera can bleach things out a bit. The various options here from 18.5 inches to 27 inches and it includes 24 inches as well. There's a one-to-one -one setting, a pixel mapping mode. So that's going to be the same as what I was showing you just before. You've got black borders at the side. It's only using the pixels called for by the source resolution. And you can also enforce a four by three aspect ratio. With the full HD or 1080p resolution, 144 Hertz now. You'll see again, it says 5120 by 1440. So it doesn't like to use monitor scaling or it doesn't support monitor scaling at 144 Hertz. But that 120 Hertz or 60 Hertz it does. So you'll see now it says 1920 by 1080, 120 Hertz. And that's what it looks like with the one-to-one -one setting for smart size. If you set that to 27 inch wide, it gives you the same kind of experience in terms of the number of pixels used as 2560 by 1440. But of course, this doesn't match the resolution, so interpolation is used. That gives a bit of a soft look compared to a 27 inch native Full HD screen. There's a sharpness control on the monitor which can offset that to a degree. So it's in smart image, sharpness, I find if you bump that up a little bit to 60, perhaps even 70, it does sharpen things up. It gives quite a nice look to the image, actually. This is a decent full HD 27 inch presentation of things. I'm now going to look at the external features of the monitor. So the monitor, as you can see, is exceptionally wide. It also has a 1800R curve, as I covered earlier. The stand base has this kind of speckled or marble appearance, so it is a light grey with a sort of blue speckling, although on most lights it doesn't really look obviously blue, it just kind of looks like it has a little slightly darker grey speckling to it. 
blends in quite well really. This gives a lighter appearance to the overall monitor and that goes with the silver plastic bezel as well. The stand neck, that is coated metal so it gives a nice solid look and feel to the central region of the screen. And just in terms of overall build quality, I'd say it does have quite a bit of wobble to it, not a huge amount, so unless you've got a really rickety desk, you shouldn't have any issues when you're just typing or using your computer. I know people don't tend to tap their monitors, I just love to do that for some reason. So you should find the build quality just fine, and because the monitor's so wide, you would expect some degree of wobble anyway. You've got decent ergonomic flexibility as well. You can tilt the monitor, you can swivel it left and right a bit, you can also adjust the height. <laughs> I thought I was going to break it then. Yeah, there's a bit of a stiff height adjustment on this one, but it does it does work with a little bit of pressure. So that's with it at the lowest stand height, and that's the highest stand height. You've got 120 millimeters of adjustment on this one which I believe is 4.72 inches. A Visa adapter is also included for 100 by 100 millimeter Visa mounting if you prefer to use that. So when you first get the monitor and you're attaching the included stand to the monitor, be aware that it does need to be screwed in to support it properly. And a screwdriver and the appropriate screws should be included in the box. The top and side bezels, they have the usual dual stage design, so there's a slim panel border flush with the rest of the screen, as well as a thin hard plastic outer part, and that hard plastic outer part is white in this case. The screen surface is glossy. Some reviewers might refer to that as semi-glossy. The reason for that is that it has a highly effective anti-reflective surface. You probably can't even see in this light in the video that it's glossy. But it is. I just don't have the room super bright at the moment. I've got pretty good control of my lighting environment. But if you go off angle, you can certainly see that it is glossy. And because of the curve, it does stretch reflections out as well. So depending on your lighting, you might notice that reflections stretched across the screen. And certainly if you're viewing it off angle, then it does tend to invite sharper reflections. I will be looking at this screen surface in a little bit more detail in various lighting conditions in the contrast section of the review. From the rear, you can see a very fresh look, lots of light matte plastics. And there's an OSD control joystick there, but don't worry, you don't have to reach for that when you're using the monitor's menu system. You can just use the included infrared remote control, which works very nicely. A few interesting features to go through. So there's a little headphone hook at the top there. It's not a super deep one though, so it depends on your headphones, but generally it does the trick. There's also a little cable tidy towards the bottom of the stand. The monitor does have an integrated cooling fan, so it has an active cooling solution. I didn't find this bothersome or really particularly noticeable when I was using the monitor. It actually just wasn't really audible above my normal system noise most of the time. I did occasionally faintly hear it, but it didn't bother me. It didn't emit any frequencies which I found annoying or anything like that. So just be aware of that. It does have a cooling fan. I know some people don't like monitors to have fans, but this one does have one. I just didn't find it obnoxious myself. You might also see these perforations around the top there and also the sides. That's the AmbiGlow RGB LED lighting solution. So those AmbiGlow RGB LEDs, they're really nice and powerful. They cast a nice light around the monitor, a nice halo. So with the LEDs switched on, you have a central section there that's illuminated, as well as the remaining LEDs, which I showed you before, in those little perforated areas. There's a dedicated AmbiGlow section of the OSD. Various different settings. I'm just going to quickly show you static first off. So this setting is rainbow, as I'm sure you can guess from how it looks. But if you prefer, you can have it set to static white, red, rose, magenta, Violet, blue, and by the way, in some regions, these might have different names. Azure, cyan, aqua, green, pear, yellow, orange, and back to rainbow. So a lot of flexibility here, and it really does give a nice pool of light. So this isn't even a dark room, and you can still see it quite clearly. So it can act as a bias light, so it can improve viewing comfort in an otherwise dim room, for example. You can also customise which zones are actually used. You can have all zones, or you can have it three-sided, which means it cuts off the central zone, or you can just have the central zone illuminated. I've had it set to brightest when I've been demonstrating it, but if you want it dimmer, there's a brighter. Dimmer again, there's bright. So with it set to bright, you might be able to see it in a dark room, but it's really very faint in a brighter room from the front. 
You can also set it to follow video and it will split the zones up into various different partitions and change based on the content on the screen. So I've just quickly opened up legom.legom.nl just to have a nice solid block of red so I can show you the zones. They transition quickly. And it's not just horizontally that it will illuminate different zones with multiple different shades possible at the same time. Also vertically. There's also a follow audio setting. You have to have audio fed through the monitor, so you'd have to be using the 3.5 millimeter output or the speakers of the monitor if you want to be doing this, and then it will just pulse according to the sound being played. There's a color shift setting, so you can see what that does. And it doesn't have to be a rainbow, you can have it set to a static color of your choice as well. You can change the chase speed as well, low, normal or high. I'm not going to show you all of these, obviously, but you get the idea. Various different animation patterns if you want to use that with light modes, wave, breathing, and starry night. The port's face downwards, so there's an AC power input, so the monitor has an internal power converter. Two HDMI 2 ports, DisplayPort 1.4 with DSC, USB-C port, and that supports 90 watts of power delivery, alongside DisplayPort Alt mode and upstream data capability. It's a 3.5mm audio output. There's an additional Type B USB upstream. The monitor does have KVM support, and you can conveniently control that using the OSD. And then you've got four USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports. The first two there, the yellow coloured ones, they support fast charging for connected devices. The monitor also has two 7.5 watt speakers, so quite a powerful sound setup on this one. And they're down firing speakers. And the sound output of them is pretty rich, pretty powerful, plenty of volume, easy to control the volume with the included remote as well. They may not match a nice set of headphones or standalone speakers but they really are a lot better than most integrated monitor speakers. And last but not least, there is a K slot, Kensington lock slot. I'm going to take a quick look now at the subpixels of the monitor. So this has a second gen QD OLED panel, and you can see that on the right there. This is different to the first generation QD OLED panels, and that's used on the 34 inch models at the moment, the 3440 by 1440 models. So you'll see that the layout is a bit odd in both cases. It is red, green, and blue, but the green subpixel is displaced above the red and the blue in a sort of triangle arrangement. And this does give some issues related to fringing, and they're all explored in an article on the website, which I've linked to in the video description. So please do have a read of that if you're not familiar with the fringing issues. They aren't really something which you can show accurately at all in a video, but the fringing issues in this case, they're not related to clear type, and they aren't something which you can address by changing clear type. It's really to do with high contrast edges, in particular if you've got white text against a black background or light text against a darker background or vice versa, then you can see this colourful fringing in places. Again, refer to the article, there's some good examples of this here. There's also a link to another 49 inch review I did of an ASUS model where I talked a little bit about the fringing there and how I felt it was improved with this more squared out subpixel design on these second gen QD OLED panels than was used on the first gen QD OLED panels. Basically that does make the fringing thinner and therefore less noticeable. But what improves it further is an increase in pixel density as you get with the 32 inch 4K UHD models for example. I don't personally find the fringing on this model as obtrusive as I've seen on W OLED monitors, it's a different type of fringing, also explored in that article. But it still has the potential to annoy some people, some people are sensitive to this, and it is certainly noticeable in places. Moving on to the calibration of the monitor now, the table here shows the central average gamma and the white point readings taken using a data color Spider X Elite Colorimeter, with various different monitor settings used. So out of the box, in terms of the colour channel balance and the white point, it was all very good. Close to 6,500k, which is my usual target. A good neutral green channel as well. So you can see for the bottom there, the adjustments I made for my test settings in the bottom table. And that doesn't include any adjustments to colour channels because it wasn't necessary on my unit. I did lower the brightness a bit. I made sure Adaptive Sync was on. And I talk a bit more about this setup in the best settings video if you're interested. As noted there, individual units and preferences vary, the settings won't be optimal in all cases, and ICC profiles aren't used in the review, 
but I have included some in the description of the video, which you can try out if you wish. One of them is created using the test settings and the other with sRGB equals on. So sRGB equals on is an sRGB emulation setting, which clamps the gamut closer to sRGB rather than using the native gamut of the monitor, which is much wider than sRGB. I've also included the low blue mode and color temperature set to 5000K in the table, just because I like to explore a little bit about the low blue light settings of the monitor, or talk just a little bit about them. So they would be used perhaps in the evening if you want a more relaxing viewing experience and you want to reduce blue light exposure before bed, which can be a bit energizing. And they both work effectively as low blue light settings. The thing is that the low blue mode itself gives a green tint to the image because it doesn't reduce the green color channel. Whereas setting the color temperature 5000K, that gives an amber tint to the image, which I find my eyes adapt to better, more readily, because it slightly reduces the green channel, as well as significantly decreasing the blue channel. The monitor includes a factory calibration report, just a very basic one. And this is with the sRGB setting. It shows that the gamma they've targeted and that the average delta E for color accuracy was 0.64 in their testing. In my testing, I found that the gamma tracking was actually with the monitor set up according to my test settings. There was a bit of bowing in the curve though, so it did average 2.3, but it was actually quite good for the dark shades, which is where I like to see the gamma tracking 2.2 more closely, because otherwise you can get too much of an, a masked appearance to dark shades, which isn't very good, or you can get too much of an unmasked appearance in artificial uplift, which also isn't nice in my opinion. So the monitor avoided that, although for some medium shades, the gamma was raised, which is why you get 2.3 average gamma rather than 2.2. A few quirks, which I have noticed on OLED monitors before, where the brightness changes and the gamma changes at the same time. In this case, there weren't massive fluctuations, but you can see at 100% brightness, it was pretty similar to with my test settings, where brightness was set to 60%. But at 0% brightness, that reduces the average gamma to 2.1, and the curve gets quite wonky. It does this below a brightness of about 20%. That's not an exact figure, by the way. This is just where the curve got quite wonky. So most people won't have the brightness of the monitor that low because that's under 100 nits. But if you're sensitive to brightness and you do want to use a lower brightness, just be aware that the gamma may be a little bit off for that reason. It's not exactly massively off and it doesn't mean the monitor's unusable by any means. It's just a little quirk I thought was worth mentioning. Using the sRGB setting, the gamma curve's a bit wonky again. It averages 2.3 like it did with the standard setting, but that's because it's quite a bit lower than it should be in places and a bit higher in other places. More specifically for the low end, the tracking is more like the sRGB gamma curve than the 2.2 gamma curve. So it gives an uplifted look to darker details, which some people might quite like. I'm not personally a fan, but I accept that sometimes monitors are calibrated that way. And that is to say that the gamma for these dark shades is lower than 2.2. For a lot of the mid shades, the gamma is too high, so that adds extra depth. And to quickly take a look at color accuracy using the sRGB setting, quite good overall. Not quite as good as the calibration report suggested, although that's using a different set of shade patches. So I'm using the Spider Checker 24 test patch pattern here. It averaged 1.06 though, which is still respectable. And the highest error there, as it usually is, it's shade 1F, Cerulean. There are quite a few of the other colorful shades, at least, are actually close to a delta E of one or a bit below that. Moving on now to the contrast and brightness. So this table here shows readings with various different monitor settings. The readings were taken using an x rite i1 Display Pro Plus, which is now branded Calibrite Color Checker Display Plus. Black luminance levels, because it's an OLED, they're always recorded in this test as 0.00, .00 which gives you an infinite contrast ratio. So it's really only the white luminance you need to focus on. You'll also notice that there's a range of values here. The reason for that is that there's a bit of ABL, automatic brightness limiter behavior on the monitor as typically observed on OLEDs. And the brightness recorded for the white patch in the center of the screen, which is used in this test, that does vary depending on what's being shown for the rest of the screen. So the average picture level or APL. So I use a variety of different desktop backgrounds, includes pure white and pure black, loads of other shade combinations in between. And I got a maximum brightness on this monitor of 261 to 285 nits. That's certainly bright enough for most people. Most people will set their monitor somewhere between 100 and 200 nits, but I do appreciate some prefer either side of that. The minimum brightness I recorded was 53 to 60 nits. So that's reasonably low, but not super low, certainly not as far as OLEDs go. And with the sRGB setting, I recorded 254 to 277 nits. 
With my test settings, I recorded 168 to 183 nits. I'm now on good old Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm going to talk about contrast performance using some in-game examples. So with its per pixel illumination, the monitor is able to show very dark content, so some pixels can be switched off or, or very close to that, depending on the shade that needs to be displayed, and others right next to it can be much brighter than that, potentially showing full white if needs be. So that gives exceptional precision, and that can really help bring out little shadow details. It can also give a nice extra depth to medium shades, sort of a solidity and inkiness which you don't really get from LCDs in the same way. And this is all very consistent throughout the screen. There's no glow of any type to consider anywhere on the screen, and the gamma consistency is exceptional, so a given shade very similar regardless of where it's displayed. So you don't get the kind of black crush as you get on VA models centrally, and extra detail peripherally where perceived gamma is too low, and you don't get the kind of vertical gradients you'd see on TN models. Yes, a few TN models do still exist. So the consistency is really lovely, but I'm talking about how things look and you can really appreciate them here in a dark room. What if you lighten the room up a bit? Well really that depends how much you brighten the room up by. So I've brightened it up a bit, but it's, I'd say it's sort of moderately bright but not super bright. The screen surface of this one, it's typical for QD OLEDs in that it's glossy, as I mentioned before, so reflections can be an issue depending on your lighting, although the anti-reflective properties are very effective. So if you have decent control of your lighting, as I do, so I've got an anti-glare blind to my left, I've got doors elsewhere which I can close or open by various amounts to, to let different amounts of light in, but I know that's a luxury which not everyone has afforded. So you do have to be aware that reflections can be an issue as it gets brighter, but the other thing is that because of the structure of QD OLEDs, the screen does actually lighten up as the room brightness is increased, and certainly if you've got direct light striking the screen. So, as I mentioned, moderately bright now, but controlled lighting conditions, so there is a bit of brightening up of the screen. You might be able to see that a bit in the video, but I can see to my eye that there's more of a distinction between the darkest shades here and the black border of the screen. But I've now let a lot more light into the room, and the lightening up of the screen has increased significantly. You might not be able to see that very clearly in the video. But again, the curve of the screen means, depending on your angle, it can pick up various reflections. But yes, I'm now in this sort of darker, tunnelled area, and can definitely see lightening up. I don't know how it'll look on the video, but if you compare what it looks like here to what it now looks like in much darker conditions. By the way, remember that the light behind the monitor is from the monitor itself with its ambiglow solution, it's not from the room. There's much better depth to the darker shades now. And depending on lighting in your room, you might notice that there's a bit of a colourful tint. It's not just that it lightens up and the dark shades become lighter, it's also that there's a bit of a colourful tint introduced. But as I said, in my room lighting I've got decent control of the lighting environment, so I don't really find this a huge issue. I would prefer that it didn't happen. I would prefer that the darker shades weren't lifted up and there was no colourful tint and brighter conditions, but I still don't need to have the room set up like a cave or anything like that to enjoy the monitor. For the brighter shades, the glossy screen surface has a really nice smooth finish to it, so there's no graininess to the lighter shades that you would observe on matte screen surfaces and also some glossy screen surfaces. Asus XG27 AQ DNG, which I just looked at, that's a glossy W OLED model that had a, quite a grainy look to my eye when I was looking at brighter shades. This one doesn't have that. There's no layering in front of the image or anything like that. And also with the ambient light, as I was talking about before, yes, you can get reflections, but what you don't get is you don't get diffused glare patches, as you'd get on matte screen surfaces. And those diffused glare patches flood the image and sap depth and perceived contrast. So it definitely has those kind of typical glossy characteristics where you don't get that kind of thing. So in my view, as long as you can control your lighting at least reasonably well, this is quite a nice screen surface. Moving on now to colour reproduction, and I like to start with Legom, legom.nl, the website, and the test for viewing angles, and talk a little bit about colour consistency, which is exceptional on this QD OLED panel. So the Legom text looks a really nice blended grey throughout the screen. This indicates a very low viewing angle dependency to the gamma curve of the monitor, which is nice to see. And solid shades are very consistent as well. I'm not sure how they will look on the video, because sometimes there are various inconsistencies brought in just because of the video. But this is a pinkish purple throughout the screen. It doesn't have obvious issues where it's much more pink towards the peripheral regions of the screen, as many LCDs will show, even some IPS models will show this, especially if they're anywhere near this wide. 
and VA models will show more significant shifts than the IPS ones even. The red block appears a good rich red throughout the screen, again really nice and consistent green block, a nice consistent green chartreuse shade throughout the screen, very slightly lighter at the extreme edges, that's more to do with the bezel design, the dual stage bezel design, very common to see that because it creates a little bit of pressure at the edges of the screen, which can slightly lighten up some shades, but it's minor in this case. And the blue block, a good rich royal blue throughout the screen. I also observed various medium shades because OLED monitors sometimes have issues with DSE, dirty screen effect. This is more of an issue with W OLEDs than QD OLEDs in my experience. And in line with that, I didn't have any particular issues with DSE on this one. Very minor striations with some specific shades, but really are very minor striations. Difficult to spot. They don't jump out at you, so it's not something I'd worry about. I'm now on Battlefield 2042 and I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using some in-game examples. This monitor has a very generous colour gamut and when you're using a colour gamut on a monitor which is wider than sRGB then most content you consume under SDR is going to look oversaturated and with extra vibrancy and that's because most content is created under SDR with the sRGB colour space in mind. So when you use the native gamut of the monitor you get a very generous colour gamut, as you can see on the screen now. I measured 99% DCI-P3 and 96% Adobe RGB. So you can see a lot of extension beyond sRGB, some extension beyond DCI-P3 as well. Very generous gamut, as you typically do get for QD OLED displays. So what this means is that if you're browsing the internet or looking at movies or you're playing a game under SDR, as I am now, then you get a real layer of extra vibrancy and saturation so the water here really stands out in an obvious way, probably doesn't on the video so much, but to the eye is really sort of eye-catching blues and bluish greens, cyan shades. The greens there for the trees in the background there, it's really too much of a bright green, a lot less subdued than they should be. The sky blues in this particular scene aren't too bad, sort of greyish blue, but a bit too much pop to it still. But in some scenes it can really look quite cartoonish because of the colour gamut. And there's also a bit of an orangey red push to the sand and you'd get the same with the rocks there but also woody tones, earthy browns and skin tones. They're pushed too much so you can have a pinkish look to skin tones or a pinkish red tint depending on the skin tone. And even the paint on the building in the background there, really very eye-catching, more eye-catching than it should be and the green on that box. You get the idea. There's just a less subdued look than there should be and a lot of these shades go beyond what the developers are intending. If you want things to look more as intended, more muted, more accurate within the sRGB colour space, then you can use the sRGB setting of the monitor for sRGB emulation. So sRGB is now set to on. With this setting you can adjust the brightness, but you can't adjust the colour channels, and you can't adjust the gamma setting. I do explore this in the best settings video a little bit more, the restrictions that apply with this setting, but it certainly gives a more subdued look, more muted look to the trees in the background there and the vegetation in the foreground or the midground I guess it is and the grass as well. The sky looks more muted as well, the sand looks more neutral and the water there also looks more neutral, more of a greyish blue colour. So if you consider the very generous gamut of the monitor and also the exceptional consistency which I mentioned with Legom because that does apply more generally so if you're playing a game just observing content on the desktop you can expect a given shade to appear very much the same regardless of where it's displayed on this very wide screen. So for colour critical work or colour sensitive work this is a really nice thing and the very generous gamut means that this monitor has good potential for work within the DCI P3 colour space and the Adobe RGB colour space but you will really want to be calibrating it because it doesn't have any emulation settings to clamp the gamut close to DCI P3 or Adobe RGB without overextension. And if you want more flexibility within sRGB, then you're going to get the best results if you do calibrate the monitor properly. Speaking of the colour gamut under sRGB, so I'm still using the sRGB setting. It now covers 98% sRGB. It clamps it down very effectively compared to natively. A little bit of under coverage, but not a huge amount. So I'm just going to switch sRGB back off just to give you a quick visual comparison or just flick it between on and off. Remember that what you see on the video is not what you see by eye, but you can still see it does make a difference to the overall saturation levels, or at least you can imagine that it will. Another thing that is worth mentioning on this QD OLED, exceptional viewing angles, if you happen to be viewing the monitor off angle, any shifts you see, they're really more due to the camera than the monitor itself. 
So whether you're viewing it from above or below or to the side, it really does maintain excellent consistency, much better than any LCD in that respect. I'd liken it to looking at a painting on the wall in terms of its consistency. It really is very good, even if you're viewing it off angle. But again, be aware of the glossy screen. If it's a brighter viewing environment, you're going to be getting some reflections. I'm back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I've got the game running under HDR. In the best settings video, I do look at the HDR modes and the settings in a bit more detail. Before showing you more gameplay, I'm going to dive straight into some figures. So the graph here, it shows the brightness capabilities of the monitor under HDR using the usual test, which has a white patch in the middle of the screen surrounded by black. The patch size varies from 1% of the pixels to 100% of the pixels. So for 100%, the entire screen is white. I do have to mention though, the test used here, it runs at 21 by nine. So although 100% white isn't affected, the white patch size isn't actually quite 1%, 4%, 9%, 25 or 49%. Be aware some reviewers will call this percentage of window or use alternative terminology to describe the patch size, but it is roughly in line with these figures. But because it's not exactly the same, I don't want to draw any comparisons with other monitors because I don't think it's quite fair. But there are two lines here, one showing the main HDR mode of the monitor. So if you set it to HDR game, movie or vivid, then you get the full brightness capabilities. The purple line that shows the monitor using its HDR true black setting, which is more consistent but limits the brightness. So you can see the peak recorded here with a 1% window, 1059 nits. So that's quite bright, but as you'd expect for QD OLED. By 4% it was a little bit dimmer at 970 nits, but still pretty good. Only a slight drop off there, but more of a drop off at 9% and further drop off at 25% and above. So in other words, ABL, Automatic Brightness Limiter, behavior is observed under HDR, and as more of the screen is bright, the peak brightness displayed anywhere on the screen is reduced, and that is typical for OLED monitors. But you can see with the HDR True Black setting, the maximum recorded was 462 nits, the minimum was 280 nits. Of course, in practice, you're not just looking at a white square surrounded by black, so things are a bit more complex than that. But when I look at the scene here, it's a nice bright look to the daylight out there. And there's reasonable contrast with the darker shades, or the dark to medium shades here. However, there is also an over brightening of a lot of these medium shades. And that's because the brightness calibration or PQ curve tracking is wonky under HDR on this monitor. And it gives an elevated, overly bright look to some dark to medium shades. And it crushes together bright highlight details as well. I'll give some specific examples as I go through this section, but remember that I'm looking at things through a critical eye as someone who's used monitors with strong HDR calibration. Note that the issues I'm highlighting can't be corrected using the Windows HDR calibration tool either. In general, the issues I'm going to highlight won't be bothersome to everyone, and there's still a lot of enjoyable elements to the HDR experience here. So I'm now going to dive into the water, and yes, the usual 10-bit color reproduction nuanced shade variety improvements do apply here. So there is a really nice variety of subtly different dark shades, but again, there's a generally uplifted look because of the PQ tracking, or what would be the perceived gamma, if you prefer. And there are also some smoother gradients observed for weather details, like the mist over the water there, for example, and the light streaming in above. So some quite smooth gradients, but as I mentioned, some of the highlight detail is blended together too much because of the poor PQ tracking. The glint on the water surface there is quite bright, contrasts reasonably well with the water, although the water, again, it's uplifted a bit, so it's not quite as deep as it should be in terms of the shade depth. Not too bad, though. But I've got the in-game calibration slider cranked up at the moment, as I'd usually have on QD OLEDs, and that would usually be the correct way to have it. And, and this glint does appear appropriate in terms of having a bright and saturated yellow in a halo, so the edge to the main warm white body of the reflection appears as it should, saturated and bright, a bright yellow. And there's an orange outer halo element as well. So it's getting the brightness and the saturation at the same time. Although the brightness of the glint itself isn't actually as high as I'd expect from a QD OLED monitor. I recorded it at 563 nits, sometimes dimming down as low as 452 nits due to primarily ABL behavior, but generally staying closer to the higher value of 563 nits. On well calibrated QD OLEDs under HDR, I'd expect it to run closer to the maximum capabilities of the monitor, so near a thousand nits. 
It could be because the screen is lifting up some of those medium shades, like around the water for example, too much, and because of that it isn't able to pump out the brightness elements quite as high. There's a power limitation there. And the sky at times, not too bad in this scene, but actually yes, when I'm, when I'm positioned here, you can't see this in the video because it just looks like a big ball of light. You can't really appreciate the details anyway, but to the eye, things are more blended than they should be here. And the details aren't as distinct as they should be. And this is something I've observed on other game titles and other scenes on this game. It's just down to the poor PQ curve optimization. If you follow through with the in-game calibration or do the same on another game or, or using the Windows HDR calibration tool as a guide, you'll be setting the monitor to around 450 nits maximum. So that's more like the Display HDR True Black 400 limit. So it seems that they just kind of extrapolated this out without really recalibrating it properly to the maximum capabilities of the monitor, if you like. So I've dropped down the in-game calibration now, and what I can see is that the sky isn't blown out in the same way, the sort of highlight details aren't as blown out, but it also desaturates bright shades. So the glint there, for example, looks completely wrong. I removed the bright colourful halos around the light glint, which should be there, so it doesn't look right at all. And interestingly, the sun glint itself, it actually remains the same brightness as it did before. But brighter elements in other scenes are capped closer to 500 nits if you have this kind of calibration level, rather than 900 to 1000 nits, as can be achieved with HDR calibration slider cranked up. So I can see that in this scene here, for example. So the floodlights there, they don't appear like a giant ball of light. I'm just going to adjust my camera exposure a little bit. Still can't show you them properly, I'm afraid, but there are little detailed sort of strapping elements to the floodlights, which I can see to my eye. And they're quite bright, but I recorded them at around 500 nits with the calibration of the monitor set to the sort of more toned down level, if you like, the in-game calibration, I should say. I've now cranked that up and those floodlights are significantly brighter. I recorded them at above 800 nits now. And I've also got a bit of an orange element to the outer rim, a bit like I showed you with the sun glint, and that's what they should look like, whereas before they looked just sort of white and undersaturated, really, without the colourful elements to them. And some of the detail is lost now because of the over-brightening of some of the bright shades here, so it shouldn't just be one uniform shade because there's really just too much blending together. I can't show you this accurately in the video, but to the eye I can still see things are too blended now. I'd say it's not too bad in this scene or for this particular element, the blending, it's not really too obvious. And I actually prefer the higher brightness level with the calibration slider cranked up on this scene. And now on Battlefield 5, and this is the nice unforgiving scene, the mountain scene, the mountain sun scene. Lots of bright shades and bright to medium shades here. And the ABL behaviour of OLED monitors does kick in pretty heavily here, and that will limit the maximum brightness, and just the general brightness you can see to the sun there, and the sky as well, the clouds, that kind of thing, and the glint on the icy surface down there. So I recorded 350 nits for the sun there, or around that, a little bit higher, or a little bit lower, depending on what's going on with the rest of the scene. But this is with the calibration of the game set to what I know to be the correct value according to the brightness capabilities of the monitor, so around a thousand nits maximum. But there's really a blown out look to the sky, the clouds, and the sun. And the shades surrounding the sun are completely over brightened, and some even blend into the sun itself, making the sun look a lot larger than it should. In fact, it looks roughly to the eye as it will look in the video simply because there's too much over-brightening going on. But if you follow through with the HDR calibration of the game, you should be setting the monitor closer to 400 nits. And that does improve this blown out look. It really gets rid of it quite effectively in this scene. But it will also cap the brightness for scenes where the monitor isn't restricted by its ABL to around 500 nits maximum rather than around double that. So you're really not getting the full capabilities of the monitor by doing this. I'm on another scene on Battlefield 5, again running the monitor under HDR, with its maximum brightness mode, so HDR game in this case, and I've cranked up the calibration side of the game back up to the known maximum value of the monitor. And I can see in this scene that it just generally gives an uplifted look as if the gamma's too low. A lot of these medium shades are quite a bit brighter than they should be. Again, like I talked about with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, you can see it in this kind of scene as well. So really it's a mixed scene where there are lots of medium to dark shades here which will show this uplifted look quite readily. I've just decreased the in-game calibration, and if anything, it makes the uplifted look worse. There's certainly just a less contrasty look than there should be to some of the dark to medium shades. If I switch over to HDR True Black, 
that does improve things to an extent. It's kind of a more contrasty look and the uplifted look is reduced a bit. It's still there to an extent though. So it's, it's clear that the PQ curve isn't perfectly calibrated, although it's better than it was before. And just remember that if you're using this setting, there's never the option to have truly bright highlights that run anywhere near the maximum luminance capabilities of the screen. I will mention though that I did measure a few highlights in various games and the maximum I recorded was just shy of 600 nits using the HDR true black setting, which is actually quite a bit higher than you'd usually see on QD OLED monitors and higher than I recorded with the white patches against the black backgrounds. So I wouldn't say this setting is dim exactly, it still has some decent bright highlights, but it isn't up to the maximum capabilities of the screen either. So overall my preference is actually just to run with the full brightness capabilities and also crank the HDR brightness up with the calibration in the game to allow the monitor to achieve its maximum brightness, at least for some elements. The blowing out of highlight details, obviously that's not ideal, but I'd again stress that not everyone will find it noticeable or bothersome, and it's certainly something that's more apparent in some scenes or games than others. So as I said, I generally prefer using the maximum brightness of the monitor under HDR, but there are some instances where I would prefer the true black setting, and Cyberpunk 2077 is one of those titles where I really just prefer the true black setting on this monitor. It just highlights the poor HDR calibration all too keenly, to be honest. And this scene here, that's one that I typically use to demonstrate ABL. And remember that with the true black setting, your peak luminance is capped, and therefore the ABL behaviour is less extreme. So the difference between the scene when I look at it like this versus that, not particularly pronounced. And switching over to my ultra wide lens so you can see the HUD elements. There are some shifts, but actually to the eye, they're not particularly dramatic. It's actually exaggerated a bit in the video here. Fairly stable, really. So not a huge amount of ABL going on. A little bit still. I've now switched over to the HDR game setting. So I'm getting the maximum brightness capabilities of the monitor and I've changed the in-game calibration to the known maximum brightness of the monitor. And really the blown out look is in full effect. So whether you're looking at bright highlights or brightly colored text in the game, such as some of the cyan text and the yellow text, there's this clear over brightening and a lack of distinction. And the entire scene here, it just looks like there's a veil of fog like there's low perceived gamma. So even when I'm looking at the concrete and the buildings, there's just an obvious uplift. Things just don't look as they should. And the ABL behavior is also in full swing. So the sky there is brighter when it's like that versus when I'm displaying a larger proportion of bright shade on the screen. And you can see very distinct shifts now with the HUD elements as well. And they're very obvious to the eye now, not just in the video. I've now reduced the in-game brightness calibration so it's more in line with where it wants it to be rather than the maximum capabilities of the monitor. Then it does reduce the over-brightening of the buildings and the concrete, that kind of thing, pretty effectively, although it doesn't look as good in that respect as it did with the true black setting. And it also limits the ABL behaviour, but again, it's more noticeable than it is with the true black setting. So I'll switch back over to HDR true black. And yes, I do prefer the representation here. It certainly is a better look. Now, I'm not saying things are perfectly calibrated or balanced with this scene and just in general using this setting. Things just don't look as contrasty or varied as I'd like. And because the luminance is capped, the bright highlights don't have the same variety I'd like to see in this scene either. But it's still an improvement over the other settings which use the maximum brightness of the monitor. Back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, again under HDR, and I've got the monitor set up using its maximum brightness and the game calibrated appropriately to give the maximum brightness. Again, I generally prefer that on this title. And in this scene, it's quite a nice bright look to the glint there, and it contrasts fairly well with the surroundings. But again, there's that uplifted look to a lot of the medium to dark shades, which means that the contrast isn't really as it should be, comparing the dark shades to the bright shades there. But there are still some quite nice darker shadow details in places and a good variety as well. And I don't see any haloing or blooming or anything like that because this has per pixel illumination as it's an OLED screen. So it can show very bright shades and much dimmer shades next to each other, but the dimmer shades should be dimmer than they appear and they would be if it wasn't for the wonky HDR calibration. So basically this scene does still look, I'd say, better than it does on many LCDs or mini LED solutions. And that's because of the precision you've got here. But 
a superior calibration would help darken some of these medium and dark shades and really bring more contrast to the scene. Now switching over to the true black setting, yes it does improve things a bit, some of the shadow details are darker, so there's nice contrast in that respect, but the glint on the water surface now is much less impressive, much less eye-catching, it's just a sort of generally foggier look in this scene still than there should be. I'm on another scene, I'm back now to using the HDR game setting, so maximum brightness capability and the calibration slider is all the way up, although that doesn't really matter too much because I'm going to talk about colour reproduction. And in this respect, remember that the generous gamut of the monitor, very generous gamut, I'm just showing you that on the screen, there's really good DCI-P3 coverage, I measured 99%, there's also some extension beyond DCI-P3. Under HDR, that kind of colour gamut's useful because rather than targeting sRGB, the developers can target DCI-P3 and ultimately they could target REC 2020, a much wider colour space. As usual for QD OLED, the REC 2020 coverage is quite good on this monitor, it's actually very good, but not perfect, it's sort of closer to 80% than 100%. So with that, I look at, for example, Lara's skin tones and some of these earthy browns, and they're not overdone as they are under SDR, they're more toned down, but there are still some nice vibrant looking shades in the mix. There's some nice rich terracotta shades for the roof there and, and some reasonably vibrant looking greens as well. Certainly toned down compared to under SDR but nice and varied and still quite lush looking in places. However, again, with the PQ calibration, it does mean that some of these shades don't have the depth that they should. The stained glass there pops quite nicely, stands out quite nicely. That guy's shirt's quite colourful. Laura's green dress is quite colourful. So yeah, it's, it's not a bad representation, but if the PQ calibration was better, then that would add extra depth and just a generally more vibrant look to some of these shades. And again with the PQ calibration, I, I know I'm primarily trying to talk about colour here, but I can see in the sky again a very blown out look with the monitor configured as I have it now, trying to use its maximum brightness. Although the general look to the daylight scene on QD OLEDs here if you're using your peak 1000 modes, usually what would happen is you'd notice some of the medium shades being dragged down, which can give a bit of a dimmer look to the sky. It's kind of an overcast look in places, even where it's not supposed to look like that. But in this one, it's more of an over-brightening. So some people might actually quite like this uplifted look, to be honest. But I will just come back to what I said towards the start of this section, that, you know, I could be considered a bit nitpicky, things I'm talking about here and the criticisms I'm raising about HDR on this monitor. If you, it really depends what you're used to and what you've seen, what you've experienced and your expectations, because there is a lot to like about the HDR on this monitor still, and some people will actually like how it represents things. I'm on Battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor now. This monitor has a 144Hz refresh rate. I've got the game running at 144 frames a second, so I'm making the most out of the monitor in that respect. This brings with it the usual advantages when you've got a high frame rate, high refresh rate combination in terms of improving your connected feel compared to lower refresh rates and low frame rates. So that describes the fluidity and the precision you feel when you interact with the game world. Low input lag also helps in that respect. On this monitor I recorded pretty low input lag, not super low, not as low as I've had on some OLED monitors or recorded on some OLED monitors, but still very low at 2.31 milliseconds. Super sensitive users should be fine with this. This combination of frame rate and refresh rate, it also improves the perceived blur or reduces the perceived blur due to eye movement. That's the main form of perceived blur you will see on a monitor, with pixel responses also contributing to perceived blur. There's an article on the website all about monitor responsiveness which explores this in more detail. It also looks at a photography technique called pursuit photography, which uses a moving camera to capture motion on a monitor in a way which reflects both elements of perceived blur. So the movement of your eyes, which is closely linked to the refresh rate of the display, and also captures the pixel response element. So here's some pursuit photographs on this monitor, running at various refresh rates. There are no pixel overdrive settings to worry about on this one. It's running at 60 hertz, 120 and 144 hertz. There's also a reference screen, which is a fast IPS model running at 120 hertz. That is the ViewSonic VX2728J-2K. And what you can see is you can see a significant increase in clarity with the main object going up from 60 hertz to 120 hertz with further refinement up to 144 hertz. And the clarity of the object, even if you're just looking at 120 hertz compared to the reference, so it's apples for apples in that respect, is superior on this OLED compared to the LCD reference. 
You also see with the reference, it's a little bit of powdery trailing behind the object. Not an awful lot, because it is a fast IPS model that I'm showing you here. But there is a little bit of powdery trailing, particularly for the dark background, which is the top row. And that's completely absent on the OLED. So there are no slower than optimal pixel responses, and there's no overshoot or inverse ghosting to concern yourself with. There's no strobe backlight setting. I mean, there isn't even a backlight, so there's no BFI or black frame insertion setting either. So it's always going to be sample and hold operation. Again, if you have no idea what I'm talking about here, please do refer to that responsiveness article on the website. And for those who prefer figures, here are some figures. These are taken using the OSRTT Pro tool, which is the same tool and the same methodology used by TFT Central, though they use their own color coding system and with OLED screens they tend to use different equipment. The reason for that is that the brightness regulation method used by OLED screens involves cyclical dips in brightness. They're slight dips in brightness. It's not PWM behavior but the dimming of the screen is such that the instrument is thrown off a bit particularly if there's zero or black involved in the transition. So don't pay too much attention to some of these particularly the first column with initial response time and also the first row for RGB overshoot. The values here are still quite good, but they're actually phantom readings because of the brightness regulation method used by the OLED here. In actuality, there's no perceivable overshoot and the pixel responses, they're really all under one millisecond. But anyway, the average initial time, 0.97 milliseconds. And as I said, no perceivable overshoot to worry about. So a really nice 144 hertz experience. If you really like the sound of this monitor, by the way, but you prefer a 240 hertz refresh rate, the model without the L at the end of the model code, that's basically the same thing, but it supports up to 240 hertz. And it also has HDMI 2.1. These figures are at 120 hertz, more of the same really. Again, be aware of the phantom readings. Average initial time again, 0.97 milliseconds. And no overshoot you have to worry about. At 60 hertz, average initial time was recorded as 1.27 milliseconds. Again, be aware that some of the higher readings are just because of the device and the brightness regulation method, but a really very green performance here. Nothing you have to worry about. So in practice, the lack of any sort of even slight powdery trailing or any real weaknesses related to the pixel responses, very nice to see. I'm on another scene on Battlefield 5, and this one is one which can highlight weaknesses with LCDs quite readily. Especially VA models, they'll have some smeary trailing quite often. And that's because of the mixtures of light and much darker shades involved with the transitions here. But with this OLED, no weaknesses at all related to the pixel responses. So just a visually flawless sample and hold 144Hz experience. So I can move straight on to talking about VRR, variable refresh rate technologies. This monitor supports AMD FreeSync Premium and you can use NVIDIA G-Sync compatible. As I mentioned earlier, you can use HDR at the same time as VRR if you wish as well. I've got the game running at 120 hertz now, which isn't really much of a difference from the native 144 hertz. I still like to explore this though, especially because consoles are limited to this as a maximum. Of course, you can't use the native resolution with a console. Anyway, as I explored earlier, flawless pixel of responses here as well. No overshoot to worry about either. But VRR does its thing, so the monitor is adjusting its refresh rate in line with the frame rate of the content. And that keeps tearing and stuttering from frame and refresh rate mismatches at bay. I'm running the game at 60 frames a second now. The monitor's running at 60 hertz to match that. Again, no issues with overshoot or slower than optimal pixel responses here. It's also worth mentioning that because the pixel responses are so fast, you can become more aware of low frame rate judder. So this is more applicable if you're looking at even lower frame rate content, movie content, which could be 24 frames a second, for example. Just the low frame rate itself can become more apparent. And any stuttering you might observe, and that can come not just from frame and refresh rate mismatches, by the way, there can be other reasons you might observe stutter as well. It can just be more obvious on OLED models like this. The claimed VRR variable refresh rate range of this one is 48 to 144 hertz. In my testing, I tended to find the floor of operation was more like 52 hertz, but I often find this with my RTX 3090, just a little bit higher than the claimed floor of operation. It does depend on the fluctuations occurring. And below that, the monitor employs LFC, low frame rate compensation. So it will stick to a multiple of the frame rate with its refresh rate. So if the game was running at 40 frames a second, for example, the monitor could be running at 80 hertz. And that does keep tearing and stuttering at bay in a similar way to the main VRR operation. Just be aware that when the LFC boundary is crossed in either direction, there is a slight stuttering but it's a subtle stuttering compared to the stuttering you'd get without VRR and with fluctuations in frame rate. But it's still something which I can notice. And because OLEDs have such good pixel responses and there's no sort of weakness there to mask any stuttering, it can be a little bit more obvious than on LCDs. 
It's not something I worry about too much unless you're frequently passing the boundary. And I'm going to talk about VRR flickering. And that is something which all OLEDs seem to show to some degree. And on this one, it's pretty typical for what I've seen on other QD OLEDs. So this test here, it causes significant and very large fluctuations in frame rate. When you're in a game, you're not necessarily going to see these kind of fluctuations, although you can in some scenes and it depends on your system and the settings you're using. And you can sometimes get these kind of fluctuations in in-game menus or loading scenes, that kind of thing. There can be sudden drops in frame rate or sudden huge fluctuations, which can cause this kind of intense flickering. But in many scenes, you can perhaps notice a more subtle flickering with smaller fluctuations in frame rate. So perhaps if the frame rate changes from say, 100 to 120 hertz quite quickly, you're not gonna get this kind of flickering, but you'll get a more subtle flickering. And the flickering here, it's related to slight gamma changes which occur in a variable refresh rate environment where the refresh rate of the monitor changes. And it's focused more on the lower end, so the darker shades. You can see it a bit for the medium to dark shades, it's not just for the very dark shades. Although in the video, it tends to capture this in a more obvious way, a much more obvious way actually, than you see to the eye for the sort of medium shades around here. And you can probably see some flickering elsewhere. But that's something, again, that's captured by the camera, but you don't observe it like this to the eye. You do notice the flickering for the darker shades and the medium to dark shades, though. So in this loading scene here, I can definitely see it with the dark grey background there. It can be difficult to give you in-game examples of the VRR flickering. This is not VRR flickering, this is just a flickering light. But elsewhere in this scene, where the lighting is more stable, I might be able to show you little bit of that. It's because Cyberpunk 2077 has a lot of fluctuations in its frame rate. Not quite as much as I was showing you earlier with the VRR flickering test, but just enough to show a bit of VRR flickering in places. In this scene, I can actually see a lot of VRR flickering right across the top of the screen there. And I'd say the, the camera's actually filtering this out fairly well. You can see it on the camera a bit more there. But the annoying thing about trying to capture in-game VRR flickering is that the flickering there is more obvious on the camera than it is to the eye, whereas the flickering there is just not captured properly. So unfortunately it's quite difficult to show you VRR flickering, but you will be able to see some. And that strange effect there, by the way, was nothing to do with VRR flickering, that was just an in-game effect. Yeah, I definitely had some then. Again, quite a bit of this is actually, I'd say, exaggerated in the video, doesn't appear that obvious to the eye, but it's definitely there. To wrap up then, I quite like the fresh styling of the monitor, and that is to say it needs lots of nice bright colours, whereas many monitors are black or close to that. The overall feel of the monitor, it doesn't feel super premium, I'd say. Um, because of the width of the screen, I do expect a bit of wobble anyway, although the neck has a nice bit of coated metal, which I like to see and I like to feel. Ergonomic adjustment's quite good as well. You can get tilt, swivel and height adjustment. And the resolution certainly nice on the desktop in terms of the horizontal real estate you have, although depending on your viewing distance, you might find that you're moving your head a bit more than you'd like to, rather than just moving your eyes. The curve of the screen I think worked well, I have no complaints about that. And I should have mentioned as well, when you're talking about using the monitor on the desktop, there are fringing issues to be aware of, being a QD OLED, reduced slightly because it's a second gen panel, but it's still there and it could still bother some people. And also you have to be aware of it being an OLED, and therefore there is the chance of burn-in, and there is a risk to be aware of, especially if you're using the monitor for a lot of productivity. But really the, the current crop of OLED monitors, they're not designed for extensive productivity use. You definitely do risk burning in, even if you're using the mitigation measures that are included with the monitor, the OLED care settings. That's not to say you can't do a bit of productivity. I use OLED monitors myself and I do use them for a bit of productivity as well, but the primary usage should really be entertainment, so movies and games. And there, the extensive screen also works nicely in terms of immersion. You get a really nice field of view for your games as well. The usual QD OLED contrast experience, perfect illumination, very nice to see infinite static contrast ratio, glossy screen with effective anti-reflective surface, it does lighten up as the room becomes brighter. Very generous colour gamut as well, so the monitor can lend itself well to colour critical work, exceptional colour consistency also helps in that respect, and it also gives a nice vibrant look to content in general. 
There's an sRGB emulation setting if you want to tone things down. That was good to see. Brightness was adjustable there, but the colour channels and the gamma settings weren't adjustable. And there were some quirks with the gamma tracking, more so with the sRGB setting. The HDR performance of the monitor. The HDR calibration was, let's just say, a bit wonky. Some people are going to still really like HDR on this monitor. You do get some really nice bright highlights and you get the Purpixel illumination, the usual kind of OLED style benefits to that. The uplifted look wasn't really something that I liked so much and I find myself split between using one of the settings that uses the maximum brightness of the monitor and using the Display HDR 400 setting, which was better calibrated but still not perfect. But for some people, the uplifted look, they might quite like that actually, it improves visibility. You don't get so much of a dragging down of shades and a sort of dimmer look that some OLED monitors can provide. But there's still ABL, Automatic Brightness Limiter Behaviour, to be aware of, which does naturally limit your luminance in some scenes. The responsiveness of the monitor is also praiseworthy, although if you find 144Hz too limited, it isn't OLED and it has exceptional pixel responses, low input lag, etc. They do lend themselves well to high refresh rates. Then consider the non-L monitor, which is really very similar to this one, except that it supports up to 240Hz and it also includes HDMI 2.1. So the MSRP of this monitor is set at £870 or so. So you do get, quite literally, a lot of monitor for your money. It's also worth mentioning, really, that they have made an effort to make it kind of an all-in-one package in terms of having an actually usable RGB lighting solution at the rear of the screen. You will have seen that in action throughout the video, and it's explored a bit more in the best settings video, by the way, but it is actually genuinely useful, unlike most RGB LED lighting features, which are pure gimmicks. And also the integrated sound system, so it's a combined 30 watts, it's got two 7.5 watt woofers and two 7.5 watt speakers. Actually quite good, I quite enjoyed using this for listening to music and that kind of thing. I tend to prefer the directionality of a good set of headphones for gaming, but it's still nice to have a set of speakers for when you want to give your ears a rest from the headphones, or if you just want to play something out loud. So all things considered, I can approve this monitor. I can't outright recommend it. For me to outright recommend it, I would have liked to have seen a bit more polish, particularly when it came to things like the HDR calibration of the monitor. But as I mentioned in the review, this is just related to my preferences. Some people might really quite like the overall image that's on offer here under STR and HDR. That's really all there is to the Philips Evnia 49M2C8900L. You'll find a link to additional content in the description of the video alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. Be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, they are nice ways of showing your support.